good afternoon and welcome to CUHK Law. Uh, my name is Stephen Gallagher, I'm the Associate Dean Teaching and Learning, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you here today to the latest in our Greater China Legal History Seminar Series. Uh, we have a great speaker for you today on a wonderful topic, very close to my, or very dear to my heart. Uh, but uh, before I start, can I just say to you that we are going to try and save some time at the end for Professor Tang to answer some questions. Uh, so please, if you have questions, and I'm sure you will, um, because otherwise I'll just monopolize the time and ask him lots of questions myself. Uh, but um, please chat them in, use the chat function, you can chat them into me, and uh, I'll try and save some time at the end to ask Professor Tang your questions. So let me introduce our speaker today, uh, Professor Tang Hang Wu. And of course, Professor Tang has been a great supporter of us, the faculty in the past, uh, and as been involved in our unjust enrichment uh, uh, conference uh, and other events. He's also uh, often uh, um, someone who comes along and, and just supports us at our events as well. Um, professor Tang is a professor at the School of Law at the Singapore Management University. His research interests include land law, restitution, equity, trusts, charity and nonprofit law. And he's published widely. Uh, his work has also been relied on by all levels of the Singapore courts, the Federal Court of Malaysia, the Royal Court of Jersey, the Caribbean Court of Appeal, and the Manitoba Court of Appeal. Um, because of his expertise, Professor Tang has been made an overseas member of the Chancery Bar Association of England and Wales, and he's a country correspondent of Trust and Trustees, a journal that I recommend to everyone. So, Professor Tang, um, you're going to talk to us today about the Wahif. Uh, I'm hoping you're going to explain to me how to correctly pronounce this because I've had the trouble with this from my students for a number of years. Over to you, Professor Tang. Okay, uh, so thank you uh, for your kind uh, introductions, uh, Steve, and thank you, Steve and uh, Dean Wolf, for inviting me to speak in this wonderful uh, forum. Uh, I'm delighted and honored to speak to all of you. So this, this paper was uh, published a few years ago uh, in Iowa Law Review. So if you're interested in looking at the full paper, it's, it's, it's free online. Uh, and uh, I think Steve and uh, Dean Wolf thought there might be interest in Hong Kong. Therefore, uh, um, uh, hence I'm presenting this paper to you. Essentially, this project uh, or, or this paper uh, is looking at... Uh, the trust as a vehicle for wealth uh, management, uh, succession planning, and looking at it from the perspective of the past, present, and hopefully, uh, as I'll show you, the future and how it would look like. And I think many of you will recognize the story because the Singapore story uh, is closely similar, is, is similar to a large extent to the, the Hong Kong story uh, as uh, Singapore and, and Hong Kong emerges as an international uh, wealth management uh, center. Now, the, uh, if I may share the, some slides that I, present, I have uh, prepared. Uh, okay, let me try this. Okay, so this is the right. So the complexity of the story or the complexity of uh, English law uh, of trust uh, operating in uh, jurisdictions like Singapore and in Hong Kong is because, as uh, Hofri Winogrado. Uh, perceptively points out that trust law operates in the conflicted side of succession planning uh, or succession and family law, both areas which are rich with cultural, uh, different cultural norms and uh, local customs that may be at odds with English law. And we see that tension flare up or, or uh, in the uh, earlier uh, or um, the, the, the early case law um, in Singapore. And um, uh, as I've seen the, the, the slides, I think that Steve has, has given uh, seminars on uh, Chinese customary law in Hong Kong. So it's, it's, it's a similar story that's, that's going on here. Now, the main, uh, 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 as the main uh, rule which, uh, or one of the main rules which uh, conflicts with this uh, um, um, 
different customs and norms is this idea of the English uh, rule against perpetuities, uh, which prohibits uh, indefinite uh, a trust uh, for a non-charitable purpose that goes on forever and ever. And um, that contradicts with what uh, the local inhabitants wanted to use, namely for uh, ancestor worship, uh, burial grounds, uh, and also for Islamic purposes, uh, something which I will be, uh, be unpacking later. Now, before I, uh, before I unpack the cases and how, show you how the, the, how the trust was used in Singapore, uh, let me go through or let me set out my theor theoretical model uh, that I adopted for this paper. Now, in this paper, I resist uh, looking at this phenomenon from the eyes of or through the concept of legal trans transplant, a uh, concept which I feel uh, carries with, with it uh, uh, a lot of baggage. And instead, I adopt uh, Isa Hussein, a legal historian's uh, a theoretical framework of looking at this phenomenon as laws travels or laws itineraries. The, the anal analytic project, according to uh, Hussein, is not that, not that simply law travels. I think for people in Hong Kong and Singapore, we accept and we know that law, law travels. But the, the interesting question that, we, uh, that, that, that I try to explore in the context of the trust is that uh, how it travels, what is brought along in the, in the travels and how it is used and interpreted in the local context. Now, another insight that, uh, that is found in Hussein's work is this idea of the travel of law not being a linear travel, i.e. a linear travel from England to, let's say, Singapore or England to Hong Kong, but this idea of a circulation of ideas, which I think is very apposite, especially when we are dealing with the international trusts or the global trusts. Uh, the phenomenon that we will see later is that the uh, onshore trust jurisdictions like Singapore and Hong Kong uh, are increasingly influenced by ideas that original originated from offshore jurisdictions. Uh, and we see practitioners uh, in, in both jurisdictions adopted adopting very similar trust structures. Uh, and this is a phenomenon which I think captures this idea of a circulation of ideas which may have started in an offshore jurisdiction and circulated to onshore jurisdiction, jurisdictions like Singapore and Hong Kong. And therefore, when I look at a trust deed nowadays, whether it is a governing law in Hong Kong or a governing law in uh, Singapore or Jersey, many of the features are very, very similar. And this is what I term the global trust, which is something that I will explore uh, at the, the later part of the, 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 the seminar. So uh, uh, it is uncontroversial. English law was uh, introduced to Singapore via the Second Char Charter of Justice in 1826. Uh, and um, this includes the law of equity. And so the, what I start out is to try to discern or try to look out at the case, early case law in uh, which dealt with uh, the use of the trust. And what I found was that uh, the, there were two main groups that were using the trust. One uh, are the rich, wealthy Chinese businessmen who were using the trust, and the other were the wealthy uh, Arab merchant class that was based in Singapore at that time. Now, in terms of the rich, wealthy uh, Chinese merchants, uh, they were using the trust for what we know uh, in Singapore as sinchu rights. Uh, uh, we call it sinchu rights because it's probably a dialect in, uh, uh, in Singapore, which is widely used. Uh, but I understand, uh, and those of you who, whose Chinese is much better than, than mine, uh, it's, uh, the, it's called shen zhu in, um, in, in Chinese. So the idea is that, uh, and I, I think that for, for many of you here, you would, not, you would be familiar with this idea of uh, ancestor worships. 
worship. So the idea is that you, and, and there, there's this uh, wonderful case law, Chua Chun Nio and Spottiswood, where we had an uh, English colonial judge extensively uh, talking and describing this idea of uh, ancestor worship, i.e. The, the idea of laying out food everyone, uh, uh, on special occasions, laying out food, uh, and 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 uh, worshiping our ancestors and thinking uh, 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 for the ancestors to come and uh, partake in the food. Now, the difficulty with so obviously for the wealthy merchant class at that point, the Chinese merchant class, this was something that was very important to them, and they tried to use uh, English trust law to perp uh, perpetrate uh, this. Uh, Sinchu rights, uh, and they would often tie up real estate uh, in furtherance of the Sinchu rights. Now, the difficulty with this is that uh, um, we know through the rule against perpetuities, which is entrenched in English law, that you cannot have a uh, perpetual trust for a non-charitable purpose, right? And uh, this was regarded as a non-charitable purpose. And therefore, it, uh, all these early, or some of these early cases failed because of the rule against perpetuities. And it was certainly not regarded uh, as a charity. Now, what happened was that we then see, so you can see that the local wealthy Chinese population, and also the Arabs, as I'll show you, were very sophisticated uh, people at that time, right? They knew how to use uh, colonial lawyers. And in the will of Ku Cheng Tiao, we see another iteration of the trust for Sinchu rights, which is uh, because in the earlier case of Chua Chun Niu, it was held to be it failed because of the rule against perpetuities. We see a, sin, uh, a trust for sensual rights being uh, expressly limited uh, for or, or during the uh, within the rule of, uh, uh, against perpetuities by uh, linking it to the royal life uh, clauses, uh, and therefore. In this case, it removes that objection that it was a non-charitable purpose trust, which uh, extended forever. Uh, and in this case, uh, Justice Terrell, uh, again, a colonial judge, interpreted this uh, sinchu rights or equated this sinchu rights trust as one of uh, the anomalous class found in under English law i.e. a trust for, for, uh, for saying masses uh, uh, in church, right? And it, he equated that. And therefore, the proposition that seems to emerge from this class, uh, from this case, is that trust for sinchu rights in Singapore are uh, valid as long as it's limited uh, to the perpetuity period. Now, what is, what is interesting is what happened to all these sinchu rights trusts, right? Uh, because although uh, it was certainly in 1933 uh, something that was foremost in the minds of the set law at that time, uh, in modern day, uh, more, in this modern age, uh, the, the younger generation may not pay so much uh, uh, or, or pay so much emphasis to um, the practice of ancestor worship. And therefore, we have... Uh, we have a case which I think illustrates uh, the difficulty with a trust that is uh, declared for a purpose uh, and that uh, the purpose subsequently falls away and it's perhaps not relevant to the lives of the future generations. And this is the Bermuda uh, Trust in uh, Singapore, which was decided in 1998. So what happened in this case was that there it was uh, real estate uh, there was a shop house, uh, which is actually not far from where I live and where I'm sitting here, um, that was uh, declared for Sinchu rights. And it was certainly, uh, and it was valid because it was during the rule, uh, it was uh, limited by the, uh, within the perpetuative period. But the difficulty in carrying out this trust was that uh, after a while, 
it seems that the and the the subsequent um, um, generation just simply lost interest in performing uh, ancestor worship. Uh, all the grandchildren, I believe, became Christians, and they refused to uh, partake in uh, ancestor worship. Uh, and because uh, the house was uh, dedicated for that particular purpose, it was badly maintained. I think the roof fell in. Uh, I, uh, I, there was a series of unfortunate incidents which involved the tablets of the uh, the tablets of the settlers being missing, the ashes were missing, etc. And they, therefore, they had to go before the uh, uh, Singapore courts to say that this trust must fail because it is now impractical to uh, carry on the trust. So I think thought that this trust, this case was very interesting because it was decided be before uh, Madam Justice Judith Prakash, uh, as she then was, she's now in our Court of Appeal. So we have an Indian judge assessing issues of whether it is uh, legitimate uh, under Chinese custom to replace the, the, the tablets and to perform ancestor worship uh, without the ashes. Uh, and I think she came to the, the practical conclusion that it was really impossible to carry on this trust and uh, therefore she held that the trust uh, failed. So what happened to the, the, the house now? It is now a Japanese restaurant uh, and, and I suppose rented out quite handsomely. Uh, but I suppose there is a more serious point to the Bermuda Trust uh, case, which is that, and, and which has resonance to this day, is that settlers have uh, dynastic tendencies. They want to perpetuate a particular purpose, which is very important to them. Uh, for a long time, and they want to tie up real estate in furtherance of the purpose. And uh, I think Bermuda Trust is a excellent example of how uh, it's uh, impractical to do so, uh, and that the purpose which may seem really relevant, important in uh, the, the settlers' time will no longer be relevant uh, in the future. And therefore, in terms of planning, I think uh, settlers ought to take heed, uh, even modern settlers of the Bermuda Trust, including um, this romanticized uh, view of one's real estate and how you want your real estate to be used. And, it, uh, and um, in a lot of the disputes that we see in Singapore, uh, contemporary disputes. Uh, it is often disputes in relation to real estate. Now, moving on to the second purpose, which uh, seemed to preoccupy a lot of wealthy uh, Chinese uh, 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 people or the merchant class at that this point in um, uh, during the early colonial days, was this idea of burial grounds, right? So for the Chinese. Uh, besides ancestor worship, burial grounds uh, or, or, or having a proper burial was something that was seen to be uh, extremely, extremely important. And we see a lot of settlers uh, trying to declare a trust over uh, real estate for uh, burial grounds for their family or their immediate family or people with their surname. Now, the difficulty with this, again, is that um, it, it runs against the rule against perpetuities, i.e. Uh, it ties down land perpetual, uh, 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 for an indefinite period, and it would not be allowed unless it was regarded as a valid charity. Uh, but it would only be a valid charity if it is uh, seen to confer a public benefit uh, to uh, or a, a wider uh, members of the society. So you have to show public benefit. Now, if you are declaring a, declaring a trust for uh, burial grounds for your immediate family members or your or, or future generations, then it is hard to see what is the public benefit that is conferred. Uh, so in order for it to survive as a charitable trust, 
you would then have to uh, widen the class of the people who may be buried within this particular uh, particular uh, plot of land. And therefore, there, there is that, that the early cases show this, this kind of conflict. Uh, certain trusts were not uh, valid because of the failure of the public benefit test and therefore was not regarded uh, as a valid charity. Now, uh, these, tr these trusts uh, subsequently fell into uh, or disuse uh, because subsequently, uh, and you can see this in this case as well, uh, this was quite an early case. In 1929, there were government uh, regulations and zoning requirements that couldn't have burial grounds in certain parts of Singapore. And therefore, we see that this, these kinds of trusts uh, being um, uh, falling out of favour uh, subsequently. So uh, because of government regulation, and we know, uh, and those of you who I'm sure many of you who have been to Singapore, uh, we are land scarce country, and a lot of these graveyards were subsequently acquired uh, by the government anyway. Uh, and therefore, we, uh, I think for Chinese people, we, are, we, we, we don't get a burial, right? We, 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 crem we are cremated. Uh, so, and, and even if you do get a burial, uh, at some time in the future, uh, you, you will be exhumed because we just simply don't have enough land. All right, so burial grounds, a second uh, use by the rich Chinese merchants, but it subsequently fell out of disfavor. So I come now to the um, other uh, use uh, by the community in Singapore, which is the Arabs in Singapore. Now, the Arabs uh, were a major presence in Singapore. They were a merchant class uh, in Singapore, uh, and they came from Yemen, uh, from the province of Hadramaut. Uh, and many of them, uh, when they came to Singapore, uh, via, I think, Jakarta, they were already steeped in local Malay customs. So they were steeped in local Malay customs and they were influential traders and merchants. So uh, the Arabs in Singapore uh, were held uh, in very high regard by the Malay uh, community in Singapore because uh, the Arabs were seen, uh, or uh, this branch of the Arabs from Yemen and Hadramaut was seen to be uh, direct descendants from the Prophet Muhammad. And by all accounts, they were very sophisticated, very wealthy, and very worldly, and they could traverse between the worlds of the local Malays and also with the colonial law. And here we have, a, I found a picture of a, 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 an Arab wedding, and you can see uh, uh, the, the integration with the, the, the colonial com community uh, as well. Now, what was interesting was that the Arabs uh, in Singapore were, uh, when they came, they were very sophisticated and they started buying up a lot of land, right? So the local, uh, I think the local Malay custom, uh, the local Malay community at that time did not have a conception of holding land in a formal sense, right? Uh, and uh, the Arabs, on the other hand, were traders and they were well aware of the importance of land holding and they, they bought up a lot of land. And I've seen st statistics that showed that they could have uh, at the height owned up to 80 or 90% of the valuable real estate uh, in Singapore in the town area at some point in time. And then some of you will ask me, is that still true nowadays? Uh, well, the position again is the Singapore government has used the eminent domain and seized away land from a lot of land, uh, uh, major landowners. Uh, and also uh, the idea of rent control was uh, introduced to break up the power of major land landowners. And so, so their, their, I suppose their status and their, their land ownership had been uh, affected in this, this regard. Now, what the 
So the Arabs were very influential, and uh, I think uh, it was uh, at some point they even owned the Raffles uh, Hotel uh, site. Now, what was interesting is that uh, the Arabs uh, then started to use the English trust law to further uh, this idea of the waf. Uh, I pronounce it the wakaf, which is the local vernacular uh, pronunciation uh, of uh, this instrument, and I'll explain to you in a short while. So the Malay community here will call it the wakaf. Now, the wakaf is very similar to the trust uh, or the English trust. And it's unsurprising that the Arabs use English trust law for that purpose. So the wakaf is uh, irrevocable. The wakaf uh, has charitable purposes, but sometimes it's mi there's a mixed private purpose as well. And we'll see that posing uh, incontent compatibility with English trust law. And the wakaf is managed by a uh, Seth law, known as, not Seth law, by a trustee known by, as the Mutawali. And the Seth law is known as the wakif. So structurally, it is, it, on the surface, it looks very similar to the, the English trust. And it's unsurprising that the Arabs tried to use English trust law to uh, further uh, the, the, the wakaf. And what was interesting is that what I found is that sometimes they will draft two sets of documents, one in Arab, Arab, Arabic and one in English. Uh, and and, uh, uh, and um, uh, hoping that the English law would honor uh, what they have drafted. Now, uh, and this, this is the early use of the, the wakaf in Singapore, and it still exists uh, nowadays. This is a mosque uh, of, uh, in the shrine of Habib No, uh, and this it was believed to be the earliest um, uh, iteration of the wakaf. Um, it still exists in Singapore, and I've shown you this picture where it is next to a highway. Uh, so the urban legend is that, uh, you know, the Singapore government acquires a lot of land uh, for redevelopment. And so too, they wanted to acquire this plot of land and they wanted to demolish this um, mosque. Uh, but the urban legend is that when they started the machines, the machines were not, could not work and could not uh, demolish this, this, this mosque. And so this mosque now sits uh, very strangely in the middle of the highway in Singapore. Now, so this uh, slide is uh, for Steve, who uh, I know is very interested in this question, is that did the Wakaf influence uh, English trust law, right? There's this theory that perhaps, right, that there are multiple theories for the origins of English trust law, uh, but one theory is that could it be that the, I think the Franciscan friars had some contact with the Middle East, right, and brought back this idea of the Wakaf uh, and that influenced the um, English law. And I've been able to find this article uh, by the University of Pennsylvania in University of Pennsylvania Law Review where there is speculation uh, that perhaps the Wakaf influenced uh, the uh, founding of Merton College in Oxford uh, because according to this author, the uh, way the, the Merton College uh, founding document was drafted was very similar to how Wakafs looked like uh, at that time in, in the 13th century. Uh, but having read the article, I don't think that there is definitive proof of this. Uh, the, the founding document did, certainly did not mention uh, the Wakaf. And I, the, the speculation, I think, is merely on the author's part that the, the founder had had contact with the Middle East and that the certain features look like the Wakaf and therefore uh, there is this, this speculation. But I don't think that there's any proof of, of this at this point in time. Now, why did the uh, 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 Arabs, why were they using the wakaf? Uh, there are several reasons why they were using the wakaf. Now, I, uh, and I didn't put, I think, I suppose the most important reason here is that in other Arab countries, uh, people use the wakaf because the wakaf is dedicated to charitable purposes uh, for um, 
uh, Islamic purposes, right? So it's dedicated to God uh, purposes in favor of God's work. And therefore, the idea is that they feel that if they declare a wakaf, the state, right, if it's an Islamic state, will be less likely to seize the property. And that was a strategy uh, that has worked in other countries. And unsurprisingly, the Arabs tried to use that uh, in Singapore. Uh, the other reasons, of obviously, uh, to prevent the state from seizing their property is to increase their family status, to take care of their family per, uh, members, and to further religious beliefs and to consolidate their land holdings. Now, the difficulty with uh, uh, or incompatibility, as I show in my article, with the Wakaf and English trust law is that the, although it looks superficially similar, there are important differences that could render uh, uh, the, the, the trust uh, invalid if it was meant or in furtherance of a wakaf. Now, the first point is the perpetuity period. There doesn't seem to be a perpetuity period in the wakaf, uh, but of course, we know perpetuity period is an integral part to, to English trust law. Now, the other problem with the wakaf is that the wakaf under Islamic law, as I understand, could be a mixture of charitable purposes and personal purposes. So you can take care of your family and you can also uh, um, uh, prescribe a charitable purpose. purpose. However, uh, we know that under English law, uh, the charity must be expressed in a form that is exclusively charitable. And therefore, some of these wakafs uh, were invalidated on this ground. Now, the other major incompatibility between English trust law and the wakaf is that something that is considered to be charitable under Muslim law may not be considered by the colonial judges at that time to be charitable under English law. So a very stark example is a wakaf to help Muslims to perform the Hajj pilgrimage to Mecca, right? Uh, under Islamic law, we know that that is a sacred purpose and that is a purpose which would be definitely charitable under, under Islamic law. But the, I suppose the colonial judge at that point in time did not uh, realize or perhaps did not understand the significance of pilgrimages uh, to Muslim persons and it was held that such pilgrimages were not charitable or such purposes were not charitable under English law. <laughs> Furthermore, if, uh, uh, if uh, the, uh, the English or the trust instrument stipulates that it is for good works under Muslim law uh, or Muslim purposes, that would not be interpreted as being charitable under, under English law. Now, um, another reason uh, why uh, the wakaf uh, was um, uh, um, invalidated uh, for men, in many cases, were was simply this: the descendants of the settlers were very litigious people. All right, uh, they were very litigious people, uh, and they used uh, continuously the power of the colonial courts and also the modern courts to try to continuously invalidate the wakaf. Why did they do that? Uh, because a lot of these wakafs. Uh, dealt with uh, land. And we know that land in Singapore, in Hong Kong, uh, are worth uh, millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. And therefore, the future generation uh, went to courts on multiple occasions uh, to invalidate the trust, to say that under English trust uh, principles, these were invalidated. And if it was invalidated, it would go resulting trust back to the estate. And since they were descendants of the estates, they would inherit the property. And these disputes, right, has literally, uh, have literally uh, lasted uh, hundreds of years. And it still erupts uh, from time to time in our Singapore courts, uh, where uh, these descendants would um, 
would uh, uh, try to invalidate the trust. Now, what has happened to those uh, trusts uh, which have survived uh, nowadays uh, to, to in Singapore, which has not been invalidated by English trust principles? So there's some wakaf uh, that still survives uh, or some... Uh, it may or may not be wakaf, it may be a private trust which survives nowadays. Um, uh, some of these uh, private trusts, um, uh, the, the, uh, the beneficiaries are in the numbers in the hundreds, and I've seen some of these. Uh, they number up to the hundreds, and some of these beneficiaries are uh, not residing in Singapore, uh, are residing in Yemen, and one can just imagine the, the complexity in managing the trust and also uh, in distributing the trust funds. Uh, but I suppose it's good news for the trustee, right? Because then the trustee gets to keep on charging the uh, 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 trustee's fees on this. So I think that this is the other lesson that we can take away from a contemporary perspective in thinking about perpetual trust, right? Are they wise? Uh, and that when the trustees number to uh, number to hundreds of them, uh, there's the issue of governance, there's the issue of cost of running the trust, uh, and also whether the purposes remain relevant. Now, the difficulty with the wakaf uh, property was that there were a lot of mismanagement involved in the wakaf. Uh, prior to uh, government intervention. So there was a lot of mismanagement that was going on. And in fact, uh, I think that there was, there's a, a Muslim scholar called Timo Koran, whose theory is that uh, the wakaf uh, had tied up too much uh, private or not private or public goods in the Muslim world. And because of the mismanagement uh, has contributed to the slow economic growth of the Middle East. And so too in Singapore, there, there are a lot of mismanagement uh, or, or the cases report uh, 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 demonstrates there were mismanagement. So we have uh, instances where the mutawalis were trying to sell the wakaf property when wakaf property ought not to be sold, right? Wakaf properties are irrevoc irrevocable property uh, for the works of God. Um, so what has happened is that the policy makers now, uh, by way of statute, uh, by way of the Administration of Muslim Law Act, uh, vest all wakaf properties uh, to uh, the Islamic Council, the Majlis Ugama Islam in Singapore. So there's the Islamic Council uh, manages all wakafs in Singapore, and uh, it automatically, all wakafs vest uh, all wakafs vest in the Islamic Council, and that uh, if you come across, and this is something I tell my students, that if you come ac across a sale transaction, and then if you see along the, the sale transaction, you see that there's an Islamic charity that's, uh, that used to hold this, uh, the title to that property is probably not keen, clean, and even if you want to assert some kind of indefeasibility, et cetera, et cetera, there will be problems later. So the Wakaf now is managed uh, centrally by the Islamic Council uh, of Singapore. And uh, the Islamic Council of Singapore, I think, tries to take a modern approach to the management of the Wakaf. Uh, they try to consolidate the land and they try to develop the land uh, and to, 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 to get a, a greater income yield. Now, the interesting thing is that uh, on the Islamic Council of Singapore's uh, website, it has been said that there, are, there, have, there has not been a new wakaf that has been declared uh, in modern times, right? Uh, so I think that there, there might be several explanations to that. Uh, I think one explanation is that uh, uh, I think land is so expensive in Singapore that people don't dedicate a, a huge portion of their real estate to a Muslim charitable purpose. The other point is that uh, perhaps they would not want their uh, charitable endowment to be uh, managed by the Muslim, uh, the Islamic Council of Singapore. They would rather 
it be managed by perhaps a private mutawali uh, or, or a private trustee. And since that's not possible nowadays, uh, uh, no new wakafs have, have been declared. All right, so I come to the modern time of the use of the trust in Singapore. And many of you will recognize this story as similar to the, uh, the, the Hong Kong story, right? Uh, so the use of the trust in Singapore is a, is a uh, I think it's not a new, it's not a modern phenomenon. We see that it has been used in, um, uh, since the colonial days, but in terms of modern management, uh, the story starts in about 2004 to 2005. Uh, and this was a time, if you recall, we were coming out from another terrible uh, disease, not a pandemic, uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, the SARS, uh, uh, the SARS, uh, I don't know, it's not a pandemic, but the, the, the incident with SARS, right? And the economy was extremely uh, bad in Singapore. And the, the, the government was looking around for new industries which it could facilitate uh, to bring to Singapore. So the, the thinking there is that we need to look for new industries. We need to uh, bring in new industries or new um, sectors. Uh, otherwise, Singapore uh, is finished at that time. And I still remember that time, the, the thinking was that Singapore would lose all relevancy because everything would just simply move to, to Shanghai at that time. And that was the thinking at that, that point in time. Now, so the, an economic review committee was formed by the Singapore government. And one of the industry which they uh, landed upon was the wealth management industry. So they said, well, we, we should make a push for the wealth management industry. Uh, and um, it was at a time that the Singapore uh, Trustees Act was amended. And you, for those of you who work in trust law, you know that the amendment of the Singapore Trustees Act was one of the influential factors for the amendment of the Hong Kong Trustee Ordinance, right? Uh, so the, the Singapore Trustees Act uh, was amended and there was a push for to bring in the wealth management industry. But I think that the, the one cannot overemphasize the change of law uh, in bringing in the wealth management industry. Or to put it in another way is that I don't think it is the change in law which brought in the wealth management industry. It was other soft factors uh, that brought in the, uh, a lot of wealth in, in Singapore. Um, I think the factors like uh, 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 good schooling, the fact that if you stay in Singapore, you won't be kidnapped. Um, and there was also, I think, other soft factors that uh, was brought in. They made it easier to buy a landed property in Sentosa Island. Previously, if you wanted to buy a landed property, it was very hard to get an approval, but approvals are usually given for landed uh, property. They uh, relax the uh, uh, permanent residency requirement, although that has been uh, now, uh, that has changed. So there were a lot of these factors. And by and large, I think that they, the policy makers were uh, successful uh, in bringing in the, the wealth management uh, industry in Singapore. Now, so uh, uh, this is a slide I always show my students uh, at the start of the trust course to uh, explain to them the relevancy of this, this course and in that uh, there are so many high net worth individuals now that are based in Singapore. So we have the British billionaire uh, from the Dyson vacuum cleaning fame, uh, the one who supported Brexit and then probably relocated uh, in Singapore and that that, uh, that the building next to him is the uh, penthouse that he bought for 50 million Singapore dollars and then probably sold uh, in addition to his, uh, I think, more than 50 million good class bungalow. Uh, we have the founders of uh, Alibaba. So I suppose the most famous founder of Alibaba is Jack Ma, but uh, we forget that there are 18 founders of Alibaba. 
and uh, many of them are uh, resident in Singapore. So Lucy Ping, who used to hit the e-commerce platform, Lazada is uh, um, uh, uh, based in Singapore. Again, and another 50 million, I understand from the Straits Times, a 50 mil, living in a 50 million penthouse in Orchard Road. Um, uh, Co-founder of Facebook, Eduardo Saverin, uh, is, has been in Sing Singapore for a long time. Uh, the richest man in Singapore now is no longer a property tycoon, but the owner of the hot pot, uh, very popular hot pot, Hai Ti Lao, Zhang Yong, who is, I believe, also a Singaporean now. So we have a lot of high net worth individuals in Singapore. And it's not surprising uh, that they, uh, I'm not saying that these people have set up, but I think it, it's indicative that when there are a lot of rich people, they will inevitably uh, settle uh, trust in Singapore. Now, what I term the global trust, and my colleague, uh, uh, Rebecca Lee from Hong Kong University has called this the international, the modern international trust, right? Is has very similar features. And I said this uh, earlier uh, in the session that when you look at a trust deed in Jersey or Hong Kong or Singapore, uh, it looks very similar. It's uh, this idea of this circulation of ideas uh, uh, of perhaps if you're more cynical, a circulation of precedents, right? Basically lawyers copying a, a precedence from one jurisdiction uh, to another jurisdiction. So here I have uh, shown a basic vanilla trust structure, right? This is a trust structure. If you go to a licensed trust company in Singapore or a bank in Singapore, this is an off-the-shelf product that they, they might offer your client. So for those of you who are not familiar with uh, trust, uh, it operates this way. So on top of the structure is a discretionary trust. And I'll unpack this uh, discretionary trust uh, in the wall. So on top of this structure is a discretionary trust. Um, and this discretionary trust, instead of holding uh, the assets directly, right? Instead of holding the assets directly, the, the um, they would hold the assets via uh, a holding company. There may be one layer or two layers in the structure. And it has been explained to me by accountants. Uh, and, but every time they explain to me, I forget, uh, how, to ex uh, I forget how to articulate it. Is that there are tax reasons sometimes for the dual structure, right? Why is there a holding and, and, and then a, 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 a subsidiary company down there, down there? But if you don't want to, you can also just have one layer. Now, uh, in, the assets are then injected into the whole the, the, the company. So basically the trust holds shares in the company and the assets itself hold uh, are held by the company. Right? So this could be could be interesting as well. So if you let's say if you have many branches of warring families, right? Uh, perhaps you have multiple wives who don't get along with each other. This structure may work as well. You can maybe hive off or have several companies and put assets for each branch of the company, uh, uh, each branch of the family within a particular uh, uh, company. Now, uh, in this structure, you'll see it's incredibly flexible because the settlor or nominees or his uh, uh, family members may act as the director of the companies. They may act as a director of the companies. While it is true that the trustee uh, or some form, some kind of subsidiary of the company will also act as the director of the company, but the mere fact that the, uh, the, the director of the company is uh, the, either the settler or close family members, it means the day-to-day -day control of the assets are or vest essentially with the, with the settler and or his his or her family, right? So in a sense, uh, you are perhaps getting the best of both worlds. You have settled a discretionary trust, yet the day-to-day -day, uh, holding of the assets, the control of the assets is uh, 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 vest in your family or effectively vest in your family. Uh, in, in a lot of these cases, 
uh, what they would do is that they will put in a so-called settler reserve power of investment, uh, and that exists in Hong Kong as well, i.e. the settler is the one who is investing uh, or in charge of investing the property. All right, so this is what I know. I, I term the, the global trust, uh, which is found in Singapore and in Hong Kong. And let me now unpack the features of the global trust. It seems to me that uh, in reviewing a lot of these trust cases, uh, uh, that these are the common features in the, the, uh, the, the, the global trust. Uh, first, the beneficiaries of the trust are not fixed from the start. So they usually say uh, they, they would, wouldn't fix a beneficiary. Instead, in a schedule somewhere, usually behind the trust, they will put in a list of potential beneficiaries. And sometimes they might not even list the potential beneficiaries at the start of the trust. All right, so it's not fixed at that point in time. Uh, what happened is that they will then give the trustee a very wide power of appointment as to who to appoint to enjoy the capital and income of the trust. Uh, there is usually no uh, mandatory period for the direction to exhaust the trust fund. So they say you can appoint anyone right, to enjoy the trust, but at the same time, you are not under any obligation to appoint anyone if you don't feel like uh, it right, from the trustee's perspective. Now, uh, the trustee is then usually given a wide power to uh, appoint new beneficiaries or exclude any current beneficiaries. Right? So uh, it's very good for the settler as well. Let's say you have a, a wife who later becomes an ex-wife. She might be a... Uh, uh, she might be a, a potential beneficiary at the start, but then later she can end up in the exclusion list, right? Being an excluded beneficiaries. So drafted in this form, it is highly, highly flexible and very useful from the beneficiary's perspective. So usually in this, these kind of trusts, the trust will say that if uh, in Singapore, we have 100 years as a perpetuity period. I know in Hong Kong, you've done away with the perpetuity period. So for those jurisdictions that has a perpetuity period, it says that after the trust ends, that it, you would usually go to some default beneficiary. And sometimes the default beneficiary is often uh, uh, stated to be a charity. All right, so... Um, what happens is that in this trust, these kinds of global trust, there is often a letter of wishes. They might call it a memorandum of wishes. Uh, they are expressed to be non-binding in nature. Uh, and over time, fresh letter of wishes may be issued. Uh, and this is actually uh, quite a common feature, I think, both in Singapore and in, in, in Hong Kong. And I've explained, uh, again, the uh, usual uh, structure uh, the holding structure uh, of these, uh, what I call term as the global trust. Uh, the investment powers are usually reserved. Sometimes, and this is a very powerful clause, right? But it cuts both ways. The settler is given a power to change the trustee, right? The settler is given a power to change the trustee. Why does it matter? I suppose if you issue a letter of wishes and then the trustee doesn't follow your letter of wishes, if you are the settler, you can change the letter of wishes, right? Or you can change the trustee. But why do I say that this clause may be a double-edged clause, right? We know from the Hong Kong case, right, which is the well-known Hong Kong case of Otto Poon and HSBC, where the former Mrs. Poon attacked the trust on the basis that the trust that was uh, the shares that were held by HSBC uh, was a financial resource of Mr. Poon. Uh, this attack came in the form of a reliance on the fact that the settler, Mr. Poon, had the right to change the trustee. And this was one of the important factors in the finding that the trust essentially was a financial resource of the Mr. Poon and therefore was subject to being taken into account in the division of uh, matrimonial property. So 
while you may want to put in all these wonderful powers from the perspective of the settler, when someone attacks this trust, uh, this could, could turn against you. Now, something that has moved from the onshore jurisdictions to the, or the offshore jurisdictions to the onshore jurisdictions is this idea of a protector. So I think 20 years ago, when you look at the trust precedent, you don't see the use of protectors being so prevalent in, in the onshore jurisdictions like Singapore or Hong Kong. But increasingly, when you look at the uh, trust precedents nowadays, uh, it, includes, it includes sometimes a protector clause. And basically, the protector is a third party who are given certain powers uh, in relation to the administration of the trust. So it might, may be that the protector is given either a veto power or a power to approve certain uh, discretionary powers that are given to the trustee. So this is another feature that is uh, 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 prevalent. Right, so uh, we see all these structures coming into Hong Kong, coming into Singapore, and these, these essentially are the modern structures that are being used. And therefore, in, I think that uh, as trust teachers and trust practitioners, I think that, the, I, that, that it is important to impress on the students that when we are teaching trust law nowadays, that these, this is the standard kind of trust being used. It's not the fixed trust uh, anymore, and therefore these are the structures that they need to grapple with and they need to be familiar with uh, in terms of the law. Now, the other uh, uh, aspect or the other point or not aspect, the other uh, uh, recent phenomenon that we see in Singapore is this, uh, this uh, family offices, uh, uh, opening of family offices in Singapore. Uh, and we have seen, I think this year, uh, the Google co-founders, uh, Bryn, who has opened a family office in Singapore. And I think Ray Dalio as well, a very wealthy investor, has also opened a family office in Singapore. Now, what, and I, and I think that this is a modern, uh, again, a, a modern iteration of how the trust is being used uh, nowadays. Uh, the idea being, uh, what I understand from our friends and friends in practice that uh, how, what is this uh, driver for the family office structure is that wealthy families are motivated by several things, right? They are motivated by succession planning. They are looking for a formal succession planning uh, vehicle. Uh, and... Um, and the uh, trust companies and the banks are essentially selling these kind of structure to them, right? I.e. to formalize their family arrangements, right? So they are saying that, look, um, to prevent disputes, and uh, this is what they tell the, the wealthy individuals, that disputes uh, within the family are the main source of uh, wealth depletion in, in families. That therefore you have to formalize your structures and you must uh, prevent disputes. And therefore they have uh, some, some, for some uh, uh, um, structures, they have what is known as a family assembly. Uh, my thinking is that it's some kind of a parliament kind of structure within the family. Uh, and then there are some people who act as the council, perhaps like the elected uh, uh, officials uh, representing different branches of the family. So there are uh, uh, structures that are put in to govern the family and to perhaps also deal with the idea of succession planning uh, and how to manage disputes between the family. So if you have a dispute within the family, perhaps what you do is that then you bring it formally before the family council and you bring it before the family assembly and hopefully you know, a wise elder will be able to resolve all these disputes before it going to open court. Now, what does it have to do with the trust structure in Singapore? The ownership structure will be that the trust, as I said in the earlier or showed you in the earlier slide, uh, is a dis usually a discretionary trust. 
right? You usually a discretionary trust that will actually hold the family business via certain corporate vehicles. So it's done that way in, within that, that, that structure. You can build this within your family office uh, and therefore you can have your operating business underneath. Now, why are, what is the driver that, uh, is, uh, that makes Singapore attractive uh, in terms of the family office structure? Uh, it's because there are tax incentives that they are given in terms of uh, the family office. So for a lot of these families, they have a lot of funds to invest. And therefore, uh, if they come in and they put it within a particular structure, which they uh, hire local uh, investment managers, they are given certain tax exemption. Uh, and the, uh, for, for our colleagues who set up the family offices in Singapore, uh, it's, I think they call it the 13X structure. Now, the other point about the family office structure is that uh, wh why are they doing this is that uh, because I think they are motivated by the OECD's common reporting standards. Now, in the past, uh, in terms of the planning, they would diffuse their family, their, their structures in multiple jurisdictions, right? Perhaps that's an idea of decentralization and diversification. But with the common reporting standards, uh, families would then have to grapple with this idea of that they have to report or their advisors would have to report to certain authorities about the structures that they hold and that if they have multiple structures in multiple jurisdictions, they will have to deal with multiple uh, they would have to deal with multiple reporting uh, requirements uh, uh, everywhere. Right, so the idea is that they consolidate uh, their holdings in one jurisdiction and therefore just grapple with the common reporting standards of one jurisdiction. And they don't have to then deal with uh, multiple uh, jurisdictions in the reporting. I think the other driver is that the, the so-called offshore jurisdictions has also been under attack, right? By a lot of uh, uh, authorities by saying that they have to show a substance requirement, i.e. you can't just put a structure there when essentially you don't have a substance requirement and uh, basically enjoy a tax advantage there. You have to show a substance requirement and therefore, if there's a substance requirement required in these offshore jurisdictions, it makes sense for them to come to an onshore jurisdiction like Singapore and Hong Kong and also consolidate their businesses here, uh, which definitely will prove the sub substance, uh, require, uh, substance requirement. So they consolidate everything in the family office structure. And within the family's office structure, besides the investment, uh, uh, investment uh, purposes, uh, the idea is that um, the philanthropy is also a huge thing in, uh, uh, for the families. They will also consolidate the philanthropic activities within the, the family office structure. And also, uh, I think it is important for the family, uh, for some members of the family to be involved in the philanthropic uh, 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 structure or the philanthropic purposes of the family. So uh, uh, although I don't have time in this uh, seminar, the, the, the Singapore government has also started to see that philanthropic offerings is a kind of wealth management or important wealth management uh, 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 instrument that wealthy families are looking at. And uh, the, they are also, in Singapore is offering products, or uh, I, I shouldn't call them products, but offering opportunities in that philanthropic space as well. All right, so what then, I mean, the family office certainly uh, is the, the, what be, uh, the bankers and the, the, the private trust companies are now very involved with. Now, what then is the future? I think, and, and I suppose this is not the future, this is actually the present. Uh, in the last four years, which I have resisted uh, unsuccessfully, uh, is this... Um, idea of uh, learning about trust over crypto assets. So I've been resisting this for many years, but uh, 
trust over crypto assets are something that is uh, occupying the minds of the uh, uh, professional trustees nowadays. Why are they thinking about it? Uh, we all know uh, that Bitcoin has now, uh, I haven't kept track uh, this week, but uh, Bitcoin has gone up to uh, levels which are very high in terms of its value. And we know that Tesla uh, recently uh, invested $1.5 billion in Bitcoin and many people are very bullish about Bitcoin, right? So we see a lot of um, institutions, a lot of families, uh, starting to think about very seriously about investing in crypto assets. So this is not something really in the future or it's not something of, uh, dealing with very uh, uh, investors who with very uh, huge risk appetite. We are actually now in the realm of uh, families, uh, wealthy families thinking that part of their wealth ought to be diversified into crypto assets and also institutions thinking about crypto assets. Now, the difficulty with uh, uh, institutions and families uh, investing or, uh, in crypto assets is this idea that if they are investing in crypto assets, they would then need a fiduciary, a trusted fiduciary or a trustee to hold those crypto assets, right? So there are legal and practical difficulties with, in relation to uh, trust over crypto assets, right? The first point is that, uh, that we keep on uh, coming uh, or we keep on exploring is that, can you even have a trust over crypto assets? And I believe uh, uh, my coll colleague in City University, Kelvin Lowe, has done a lot of work over this trust over crypto assets, i.e., uh, are crypto assets even property in the first place? And is must it be property for you to be able to uh, uh, declare a trust over crypto assets? So I think that's the first, I think, conceptual hurdle that the trust industry uh, is uh, grappling with. I think the other idea is, or the other uh, difficulties in terms of crypto assets are the uh, practical difficulties involving in administering a trust over crypto assets. Uh, I think one difficulty is how do you hold the keys uh, that you need to use to access the crypto assets? Uh, what I understand is that the keys to a crypto asset is not a physical key, but a string, a numeric string of numerical and alphabetical or, uh, uh, characters, which is just too long for you to memorize, right? So how do you hold the key to the crypto asset? And the other idea or the other feature of the crypto asset is that once it is transacted, you really don't have anyone to run to, to to get your crypto assets back. So these are uh, questions uh, or, or points or disputes, or not points or disputes, these are questions or issues that, are, uh, that trustees are grappling with. Uh, because trustees see uh, being a fiduciary over crypto asset as a, uh, there is a market over it, uh, or there's a market for it, uh, but these are issues that they need to grapple with. So again, this is not uh, this is not a something that is in the future. I understand in Singapore, and I'm sure likewise in Hong Kong, there are professional trustees now that offer fiduciary services over crypto assets. They say that uh, they have. Uh, 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 they have uh, 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 technical advisors to advise them in relation to how to hold the keys in a secure manner. They have procured insurance, proper insurance uh, underwriting from recognized insurance companies on how to insure the crypto assets uh, and how to manage these crypto assets. Of course, uh, uh, what I understand is that the services that are being offered now uh, is uh, very uh, expensive uh, at this point in time. Uh, the, the services uh, 
are very expensive at this point in time, but uh, the trustees are certainly seeing this as a potential source of revenue. Uh, and I think that in Hong Kong, uh, we will also see a similar uh, story as well. So I think I have um, seven minutes early, but perhaps we can take questions. So uh, the references that I have here is the article that I have uh, on, uh, it, that are published in uh, Iowa Law Review, uh, and also the, I, uh, the, my musings on uh, trustees, investment duties, and crypto assets in trust and trustees. So with that, thank you very much. Uh, I think I've gone on for too long. Uh, happy to take any questions or comments uh, if you have any. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hang Wu. You didn't go on for too long at all. I was enjoying every moment of it. Uh, it was an incredible range, by the way, wasn't it? Going back 800 years to the origins of the common law trust. Thank you very much for that. And coming up to crypto assets at the end and even touching on, well, even going on to heritage as well with, uh, with mosques, shrines, and even hot pot coming in there. So a full range of everything. Thank you for that. We have got questions. Uh, again, if anyone does want to chat any questions in, though, please, we have got time for questions. Um, I just wanted to, for my benefit, can I just say it was really interesting to hear you talk about the Sinchu uh, Trusts in Hong Kong, uh, sorry, in, in Singapore, because I think the colonial judges in the Strait Settlements were perhaps more generous than the colonial judges in Hong Kong when it came to ancestor veneration. I think we have more problems with the with the validation of trusts. Uh, in particular, I thought the the Kuching uh, Tao case very strange to actually validate that with regard to a royal lives clause. Um, I don't know what your feelings are there. For me, that was a trust of imperfect obligation, if anything, and I couldn't see how a royal trust clause would work with that one. Have you got any views on that particular case? So, yeah, so I think that in that case, they equated that with the the imperfect obligation of saying masses for the dead. So they equated that uh, with that and that it was validated because it was within the perpetuity period. But I'm interested to hear in Hong Kong, how did the judges interpret uh, ancestor worship? Did they say that it was uh, invalidated because they didn't, they didn't equate it with the imperfect obligations under English trust law? I think we've got very limited cases where it's actually been validated. If it has, I think it's only if it's been restricted to a 21 year period. We you know, we the traditional, you know, life in being in 21 years, okay. of course, not being a life in being, okay. which is why I thought it was very strange uh, that uh, in in Singapore it was actually equated with a with a human life because of the royal lives clause, which okay. doesn't really usually go with a trust and perfect obligation. The others, I think, apart from that, they were generally considered to be invalid because they couldn't be charitable trusts because the ancestor veneration was usually conducted in private uh, okay. there was no public element to it so that was uh, that's, okay. that's my sort of experience of reading about those cases but I yeah, thought so so Stephen one thought that has often occurred to me is that um that although what we see in the law reports right we see some of the cases Perhaps what happened, and this is speculation on my part, is that the family members then came together and then sold the property or someone in the family then sold the property uh, after a few generations and we don't see the cases. Uh, so that's what I suspect happened to some of these uh, uh, ancestor worship trusts. I, I think you're quite right. And of course, I think that many of them would have been unofficially, would have been just sort of familiarly enforced rather than looking for legal enforcement of it. In Hong Kong, we're very proud of our Chinese customary trusts in the new territories. Yeah. And we've seen a number of cases where we have a, a number in our uh, reports, which tell us that the, you know, they, they weren't recognized outside of the new territories. Attempts to recognize Tongs and Joes in, in, on Hong Kong Island were always said they, they couldn't be recognized. But I think in Singapore, you know, they probably would have been unofficial uh, and, and, and enforced in those ways. Yeah, I think that's that's probably the, the point there. It's also interesting to see your, your comments about these trusts for burial grounds as well. I think you're right. I, we, we, we had the issue in Hong Kong. Um, I think the colonial government in Hong Kong pushed early on to try and change it, bur people's burial habits because of the concerns about the, the lack of land. And when I was visiting Singapore before, a few years ago, I know there was a big uh, controversy going on about the, the digging up of one of your big sort of heritage burial grounds as well, um, which 
we haven't had that much trouble in Hong Kong at the moment. So I think we've still got preservation of our sort of old burial grounds, but we had a general change, sea change in attitudes in the 1950s uh, over to cremation. That's all. Um, so yes, thank you very much for all of those different things. I've got uh, some questions that have come in. If you don't mind, I'll read some of them out. Um, great talk, thank you. Uh, read your theoretical concept. Um, uh, according to Isa Husin's uh, theory, law travels and changes en route, but is it not the arrival which is more important than the journey? Because on arrival, the law needs to fit in, uh, i.e. the path dependence of legal transplants. Is that correct? Right, so uh, I think that that, that, uh, that is an uh, uh, interesting observation. And from the Singapore experience is that the, what happened was it arrived, English trust law arrived, and what the, uh, uh, the inhabitants did was that they saw that the law arrived and they tried to use it for a particular purpose to fit their local customs and norms, right? Uh, and we see some changes, as, as Steve, you, 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 you uh, mentioned that in Singapore, it was equated, like ancestor worship was equated with uh, saying um, masses, uh, prayers for the uh, masses for the dead. So yes, it's true. It, there were some changes, but on some level, uh, some of the principles were held to be sacrosanct and wasn't, didn't change. In fact, what it did was that it knocked out those uh, customs that, uh, uh, customary purposes that people tried to use uh, using English trust law. So I would agree to a certain extent that uh, it is the arrival that is important and it does change, but on some level, certain principles are held to be very sacrosanct and does not change. And then uh, that, poses the tension with the local customs and norms. But thank you for the very good comment. Thank you. I think that is an interesting question because again, we can see that I think in both jurisdictions in Hong Kong, again, we had the, um, our colonial judges trying to interpret Chinese customary trusts, which of course, you know, Malcolm Mary and others have written and said they weren't trusts. They're not trusts at all, you know, but, but of course the judges, all they could do was look at their common law ideas and, and try and fit these things in. Yes. So I think they did must have done the same in, in Singapore yeah. as well. And with the with the Wakif or Wakaf as well. So, uh, another question. Uh, you you said that are perpetual trusts wise, um, but isn't that sort of extended per perpetuity period what settlers want today? Isn't that the drive behind the special trust jurisdictions or one of them? Yes, so uh I am not a fan of trust that lasts indefinitely. I know that in Hong Kong, uh, the, Hong Kong has done away with the rule uh, against perpetuities. The trust industry in Singapore is always lobbying the government to do away with the trust, uh, uh, the rule against perpetuities. Now, I understand that's what settlers want, right? If I am a wealthy individual, uh, I want to, I, I perhaps have a dynastic tendency, I want to set up a trust that lasts forever and ever. But I personally think that it's not a wise decision to set up a trust uh, for several reasons. I think after the third generation, I think we can never anticipate what has what happened. After the third generation, the purpose that was uh, that was set out initially would just simply lose uh, relevance. And we see the ancestor worship trust, uh, for example, right? It might be very important during the colonial days, uh, but uh, is it is it really wise uh, to to set up for let's say a hundred years uh, of that of uh, perpetual trust? The other point is that the diffusion of beneficiaries or the proliferation of beneficiaries is something you need to uh, un, uh, be, be wary, of, wary of, right? It could be, and in most of these cases, the beneficiaries will then number up to a hundreds and they are all scattered all over the, uh, the, the globe. 
and then each will benefit a little bit from the trust. Uh, and there, there are two implications in relation to that, right? One is that uh, nobody really benefits a lot from this trust. I suppose the only person who benefits a lot from this trust is the trustee, right? Because <laughs> it costs so much to run this. Uh, and also in terms of when there are so many beneficiaries, really does it does it really make sense to, to have a perpetual trust? So while I, I appreciate and I understand that these are what the client or the settler want, uh, but if they are willing to listen, uh, perhaps uh, as an advisor or as a lawyer, whether we need to have that conversation with them uh, to ask, uh, to, to let them think about whether it's, it's really wise to have a trust that, that runs perpetually. Yeah. But I mean, uh, in unsuccessfully, I can think of my own conversation with a settler who wanted to have a perpetual trust and he wasn't impressed. <laughs> well, it, yeah, it, interesting because again, back to that question of what the client wants. We've seen so many cases recently where the clients have got everything that they wanted and then things have gone terribly wrong. So I think of the CFA case with the D DBS and, and things like that here. So, but um, again, I should uh, I should mention that I was involved in a very small way in that decision not to, to abolish the rule against perpetuities in Hong Kong. So I've been crossing my fingers every so ever since that nothing goes terribly wrong uh, because of this. Um, the the other thing, I just again bring it back to those Chinese customary trusts and that sort of idea of, of how the the courts interpret the, uh, the colonial courts in Hong Kong. They accepted that they were perpetual. And we've then had the problem subsequently, of course, that, well, certain uh, um, academics have now said that perhaps they were never meant to be perpetual anyway. Um, and then we now have the problem with some of them with, as you say, either there's a diffusion of the beneficiaries in all different jurisdictions, or, and there is no one in Hong Kong anymore to perform the ancestral veneration rights. And then we get the breakdown and, and what happens at that point. Do you, you know, do you allow the trust to actually be broken up, brought to an end or whatever else? So that's been, uh, that's been an issue in Hong Kong as well. So yeah, I think, uh, Steve, I think what I, I think, again, as a speculation, because sometimes when I drive, I see this little, small, little temples in, in Singapore, right? It's uh, actually part of a house, but it looks like a temple. Uh, and they are very old and uh, run down. I think the, those are problems as well, right? Because those were probably some kind of charitable trust that was declared, but the person who runs the temple is now very old, perhaps have no energy to run the temple. So what are they going to do in relation to these little, little temples that are used to be a charitable trust? So I think that is another problem. We get we get those uh, on a sort of a local clan or, or uh, Tom and Joe basis in Hong Kong, and again we see those getting very run down. Um, I've been quite pleased to see the one local to me that actually recently got completely demolished, but a new temple was then built with two little houses next to it, which I take it are sort of funding the maintenance of that particular building. But it is it's it's interesting to sort of compare those developments in the two jurisdictions in many ways. Uh, a more up to date question. It's coming. Uh, are family offices becoming equally important in Hong Kong and other jurisdictions? Can you say more about the reasons for this new development? I don't know about the Hong Kong position too much in terms of family offices, but certainly in Singapore, family offices and funds are huge uh, areas of uh, growth in, 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 in Singapore. So for example, uh, friends who work in the local uh, law firms are in the funds practice during the pandemic, they say that there's actually an uptick in the, in the work. Uh, and certainly family offices are, are a huge growth area in Singapore. Uh, in relation to Singapore, I, uh, Hong Kong, I'm not sure whether family offices are also a big, uh, big uh, area of growth there. And you, you mentioned uh, the use of protectors uh, coming in more and more. And again, you mentioned the, the Otto Poon case. For me, uh, Otto Poon, I think, had made himself protector and then reserved to himself the power to remove and appoint the, the trustees. So is that something you're seeing the use of that term protector, which which really doesn't mean anything, it doesn't have any specific meaning. Are you seeing that more and more in these trusts? Yeah, so it's uh, it's quite uh, it's quite un 
it's it's quite common nowadays to see a protector clause uh, in in an onshore jurisdiction. And I'm not surprised, right? Because HSBC certainly have a presence in Jersey, and then the trust precedents will cross fertilize, and you see features in both jurisdictions, or, or the you see features in the Jersey trust being articulated in the Singapore trust, and also the the the, the perhaps the Hong Kong trust. I think the Otto Kuhn case, uh, uh, case involved a Jersey trust. I think that was a yes, yeah. yes, it was a Jersey trust. It wasn't a Singapore trust. You also, you're right. It was a Jersey trust as well, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And of course, in England, uh, we had the High Court decision in the uh, the Pugachev case, Mesprom and Pugachev, yep. which again, Mr. Pugachev was a protector. Yep. All of those reserved powers that you mentioned before to do with investment, to do with removing and appointing trustees um, with the underlying companies, really the structure you were outlining before. Yep. I mean, is there a point, this is from me, is there a point where you know, that was interpreted in a number of ways by uh, Mr. Justice Burse. Uh, some people say it was a sham uh, or whatever. I, I prefer to think that he was looking at it and saying the true effect of the trust was that this was a trust of Mr. Pugachev, really, that the assets were there for him. But do you think there is going to be a point where we are going to get some of our appellate courts actually looking at this in the future and saying these are not trusts? Okay, so I, I take a very cynical uh, view to, in relation to this, uh, and I'm not defending uh, these trust structures, right? So I'm not defending this these kind of trust structures, but I don't think a court in Hong Kong or in Singapore would look at these trusts and say, well, you know, they, they aren't really trusts, they are so massively discretionary that uh, they are not really trusts, because if they did that, uh, it would mean, I suppose, the end of the wealth management industry in both jurisdictions, right? So I take a very cynical view in relation to this. And also the fact that judges uh, generally from both jurisdictions, they were, are from, they are chosen or selected from the practicing bar. And therefore, the members of the practicing bar would have come across these trust structures in their time of practice. And this is not something that's not familiar, un, un, something that uh, would be familiar to them. So I don't think that they will uh, invalidate those trusts. And I think that it will come from the uh, perspective of uh, self-interest of the jurisdiction Right and also familiarity with the 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 the, the precedents in their time of practice. Yeah. I think that's a that's a very nicely cynical view. I quite agree with you in many ways. The uh, the other issue, of course, is in deciding that these uh, these trusts don't exist; that they are a sham. Of course, that has very important knock-on effects for yeah. the professional trustees as well, doesn't it? Yeah. When we think about some of the arrangements that have gone on, particularly in ongoing cases in Hong Kong. Uh, and sorry, just to follow on my own from there, with the DBS decision uh, from the CFA, well, the, the comments really, because of course uh, an agreement had been made in that case. Um, there is an argument there, of course, that not only do the, does the, the settler end up retaining so many powers and complete control over the trust, that they then try and exclude the trustee from any involving in the underlying running of the company, even though an associated uh, 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 entity of the of the bank becomes the director of the company, um, and because of this, there is almost no fiduciary obligation on the trustees. So again, I mean, I know that it was decided in the DBS that there was a trust, uh, and that there was an irreducible core of fiduciary obligations. But do you see that being eroded in the future? So I think the the DBS and Chang case is interesting, right? Because Basically, I think that ultimately I have sympathy with uh, DBS uh, and, and not just because it's a Singapore bank, but because ultimately the Seth Law wanted to have control. The Seth Law wanted to direct the investments and when she directed all the investments and she lost all this money, she turned around to DBS and said, well, you know, you should have done something. So I think in terms of that decision, I think that that decision is probably right. But I caution, uh, I, think, uh, uh, I think the uh, friends in the trust industry to rely on this case because it's uh, easy to flip the facts of the case and 
think about a more sympathetic uh, claimant in that case, right? So suppose this trust uh, excluded uh, um, that Madam Chi and Mr. Chang, and the trust was mainly for the minor children, right? It was mainly for the minor children, and that uh, if all the monies were lost subsequently, uh, it could be that the minor children will bring DBS Bank and say, you know, this is a trust for minor children. You were supposed to protect me uh, and it's supposed to protect me from my parents in making uh, unwise investments and therefore you are under some liability. So in that context, right, uh, one can say, well, maybe the exclusion clauses, the exemption of duty clauses may work, but the claimant will be very sympathetic in that kind of scenario that I think that the court would may try to find a way uh, in, 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 uh, in terms of the liability. So I don't think that DBS and Chang will be the last word in, of, uh, in, in this case. Um, but uh, of course, we all know the exemption clauses, exclusion of duty, exclusion of Bartlett uh, has been effective uh, in recent years. So. I, I quite agree. I think that the uh, the fact that, of course, the the plaintiffs were not the they they didn't attract much sympathy in many ways because of the instructions they given. Yeah. As you say, if it had been a different, if the plaintiffs had been different in some way, there could have been a lot more attention paid. As you say, a focus on the children would have yeah. been a, a different approach. I think in many ways. Anyway, we should we should go back to the questions that I'm getting coming in because I know we're now running out of time. Uh, would there be any advantages of using a WACAF structure nowadays? Uh, so in Singapore, if you use a WACAF structure uh, or any WACAFs, right, it will immediately uh, vest in the uh, Islamic Council in Singapore. And therefore, people don't use a WACAF structure. Uh, if you are very uh, religious and you are looking for a Sharia compliance structure, I think the leader in this uh, area will be uh, the jurisdiction on Labuan, right, which is a little island of uh, Malaysia. So they, they are very innovative and they have all sorts of Sharia compliance structure. And uh, if you're, that is what the client is looking for, then I think that you would choose a jurisdiction like Labuan where you would structure your, 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 your transactions. Otherwise, it would be... Uh, automatically vesting in the uh, Islamic Council in Singapore. Thank you very much. I think we've got to draw it to an end there. I apologise to the people who've sent questions in and I apologise for monopolising, but uh, you, you raised so many themes that I think are of interest to me um, that I, I had to take advantage of my position and ask some of those questions. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for a very, very interesting talk professor tang and we're looking forward to seeing you again well very shortly uh, to come back and join us for our other events if i can now just ask my colleague connie to share some details of some upcoming events uh, on the 25th of march we have the latest now cross-border legal issues dialogues with professor yun xiao uh, talking about the latest development of the hate conference on privacy international law and the hate judgments convention um, that's a lunchtime talk, very similar to the Greater China Legal History series. Uh, and then we have on the 30th of March, well, it's my good friend, Dr. Stefan Gruber, who will be talking about human rights enforcement and compliance in heritage protection in Asia. Uh, that's an evening talk, 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. Uh, on a Tuesday. So please come and join us for that. Uh, as I said, uh, uh, Professor Tang will be coming, oh sorry, I didn't realise I put the third one, can we go on to the third one, I will mention this because this again is something I would love to publicise, that this is our great colleague Mr Paul Mitchard QC, uh, who is the Director of our Career Planning and Professionalism. Uh, now we've managed to convince him to talk about his experience in the past in arbitration, so he's giving us a talk entitled All You Ever Wanted to Know About Arbitration But We're Too Afraid to Ask, on the 7th of April, 5.30 to 6.30 in the evening. I'm hoping, even though it's a public forum, he will be able to uh, share with us some of the interesting things that have happened to him during his career as in, in arbitration, and perhaps even talk about his time when he was working for Chelsea Football Club, because of course, Chelsea Football Club is the best football club in the world. 
So let's hope he can share that. Apart from that, we're looking forward to seeing Professor Tang back in the near future, as I said. And uh, I'd just like to once again thank him very much for a really interesting uh, uh, seminar. Thank you very much. Uh, apart from that, thank you very much to all of you for attending, joining us again, and we look forward to seeing you in the near future uh, and at our events. Um, and thank you to our admin colleagues, in particular Connie and her team, for all that great support they give us for all of these events and make sure that things run smoothly. So thank you. We are CUHK Law. Bye-bye. <laughs>